G'day, my name is Tom, and today I'd like to talk to you about uh, postsynaptic potentials and integration. So this is a picture you should be familiar with from uh, part A, and I won't go through all of it, but uh, basically you have a an action potential here, causes all this stuff to go on, pardon me, and uh, eventually you get the exocytosis of... Uh, neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft which is this area here and of course the neurotransmitter binds onto the receptors and I'm going to use each one of these receptors slightly differently but in a normal neuron they, they would generally be of similar nature uh, but you know you, you would have one of these receptors on so you know you'd have different combinations but for this one it's a bit unusual. Um, basically, and as we discussed in part 8, uh, these receptors control the movement of ions via ion channels. So, we can have ion channels being opened that will let in positive uh, positive ions such as, uh, well in this example it would probably be small uh, you know, not non-selective for particular ions, but just small positive ions being let through. Um, and also, though, it's, you know, it has to let some out as well. It's, it's, it's just opening a channel. It's not actively bringing stuff in or out. It's just opening a gate. And that gate, um, it, depending on the concentration gradients of particular ions, will depend on what comes through that gate. In this example, we'll have um, a lot of sodium ions coming in, and we'll have some uh, potassium ions going out. But the net result, the net flux, if you like, is going to be positive inside. Um, but we can also have uh, negative ions going in or out, um, or you know, we can have a negative potential inside. Um, so, you know, if we, if we well actually some, what some neurons do is they actively pump out uh, chloride through the use of ATP, and then they can pump it back in because they've created this artificial concentration gradient. And so, when chloride comes in, then you have negative, um, a negative potential inside. Um, another way is that you can have um, sodium, uh, sorry, potassium being sent out. And that actually causes, because it's only selective for uh, potassium, uh, it'll, and, and it's being let out, it's going down that to me it's concentration gradient, then you'll have a negative result as well. So these negative potentials here are what's called as inhibitory postsynaptic potentials because they will inhibit the ability of, in this case, the postsynaptic neuron to, um, to create an action potential, uh, whereas uh, the this one here, where we have the result of a positive potential, is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, because it's creating a situation where the neuron is more likely to create an action potential. So here we'll graph the the EPSB. Basically, it's a just a small increase here generally. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where um, the, you know, neurotransmitter bound and, you know, let some ions in and you create that EPSB and um, don't know why I'm doing this on two different graphs, but oh well. Um, and then going down there, that would be an IPSP. Um, yeah, so obviously right there is where the ion channels opened. Um, in these examples. So 
So that's IPSPs and APSPs and um, now we're going to talk about how they can integrate or how they can uh, work together to create or limit um, the amount of uh, you know uh, action potentials or whether or not an action potential is produced at all in a neuron. So here's you know here's a a neuron. Uh, its axon goes down that way, and these are dendrites here. There's the cell body, uh, and these are uh, uh, presynaptic neurons in influencing this this neuron. So this one is going to be uh, uh, we'll call this one A and we'll call this one B and they're, they're exhibiting or they're, they're making EPSPs um, and, of, and of course that is a greater potential remember and so it'll slowly you know it's going in all directions but this is the direction we care about a bit towards the initial site because it's got the lowest threshold um, for creating an action potential and that's actually due mostly to its high concentration of um, voltage gated sodium uh, voltage gated sodium channels sorry and um, and this one here we'll call this C and that's uh, creating IPSP and that you know again it's a greater potential so here it's looking like if we fired all of these three at the same time overall we'd get a positive you know roughly um, and we can graph that here uh, if we fired just A say here and then B and then C um, we'd get something like you know like that for A like that for B and then for C we'd get an IPSP alright what we saw before but if we had um, if we fired A and B at the same time, so if we fired both of these, um, and they both created uh, EPSBs, then we'd get something called summation. And in this case, it'd be called spatial summation. So that looks something like this. So, you know, it just adds them together. It's nothing particularly special, but you might remember it from the greater potential videos. Now if we did uh, say A and C at the same time, then we might get something like this. Pretty much nothing, because uh, the, the EPSB is going to be cancelled out by the I IPSP so you know pretty much no change um, now so this is all these these are examples of spatial summation there's also something called temporal summation so that's over time and if we if we did say a a a a lots of a's then what would we get well, we'd get a situation where it doesn't get a chance to re to fully get back to the resting membrane potential, so it goes up. Then before it's able to get all the way down, it goes up again, it goes up again, it goes up again. Maybe in this case it just doesn't quite get there. And it'll eventually come down. It'll take a bit longer, but it'll be something like that. And so this is called temporal summation and then over here uh, this sort of stuff where we have A and B or A and C this is called spatial summation now I talked about before that the, at the initial segment uh, there's um, there's a high concentration of uh, voltage gated sodium ion channels and that's what causes the threshold to be so low there well so yeah and this is the this is the initial segment part that I was talking about well actually there's um, other spots along in the neuron that can have 
lower thresholds due to high concentrations of these voltage gated sodium channels and they can actually be along dendrites so if for example we had one here then um, or, or you know actually well no it's not going to work like that forget that bit if we had one here um, then what would happen is if we had uh, this EPSB reach a threshold here to create an action potential then we get an action potential here right and that will mean that we get a greater a subsequent graded potential which is stronger and and you know stronger than it would have been otherwise basically so this can amplify signals along a particular dendrite um, in this case it wouldn't work because um, you can't have a negative action potential that's not there is no such thing so um, action potentials are you know always um, always positive so um, yeah so I hope this has been interesting uh, actually there's one other thing um, I suppose just just to help consolidate this idea of uh, you know where you have inputs uh, it matters quite greatly where you have inputs if you had um, if you had an uh, a neuron exhibiting an IPSB here but the EPSBs were back there then you can imagine again this would have a very large negative impact here and probably override you know it doesn't matter how much these guys fire or in unison you know when they fire it probably is not going to overpower it or get it you know to threshold um, probably not but you know it's it's sort of like because it's a greater potential it's getting exponentially weaker as it as it travels distance um, or as it spreads it doesn't really travel so yeah I hope this has been interesting and um, yeah this has been part nine uh, postsynaptic potentials and integration thanks